Hello and welcome to another episode of the Healing with Coherence podcast series founded by Radiant Life Technologies. My name is Mikhail Cvetanov and I'm your host. And this is episode seven of the series delving into the profound transformation of healing science, medicine and technology happening in the world today. And you can find us on all major podcast platforms and social media networks. So if you are not yet subscribed and part of our community, hit the subscribe or follow button right now and get all the episodes. My guest today is the amazing Dr. Robert J. Newton from USA, California. Dr. Newton is a healer, teacher and lecturer. He's a motivational speaker, researcher and writer. He's also a bachelor in speech and English. He has two doctorates in law and natural medicine and many certifications in natural healing. He also has more than 40 years of experience and training in Kriya Kundalini Yoga and he is active in many, many other fields uh, of which we'll be talking today. And what is the most important thing, uh, what actually caught my attention is that uh, Dr. Newton has been on a mission from very early age. Uh, he discovered his purpose and mission in uh, at about age of five years when he uh, understood that he is on a mission or should be on a mission to uplift and revive the earth. And I would like to understand today how he has been doing on his mission and how far he has come to uplifting and reviving the earth and humanity as a whole. Dr. Newton, welcome to Healing with Coherence podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you uh, for waiting for me to get my act together so we can start the interview. I like to make fun of myself. <laughs> That's absolutely all right. Yeah, I've, I've heard a few of your shows. Uh, you've been running uh, your own shows for many, many years. And uh, you have a very, very funny entry to the show, which you've been using the last years. Can you maybe yeah. uh, do your do your show entry for my show? Okay. Let's see. Okay. Hey, 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 namaste. This is Dr. Newton, and let's get ready to rumba. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> I used to say rumble, but, you know, there's enough fighting going on so quickly I had to make, you know, the flip because that's the big entrance for the MMA um, extreme fighting. And I actually like watching that. It's almost like an art because I'm all so martial artist so you know i'm le i'm learning new moves <laughs> well that's perfect that's perfect because you know like movement is a big uh, part of my life as well i like to move and uh, that's good that you are bringing that up so maybe i will start by asking you what are your movements today um today i'm just trying to I'm trying to assemble how that uh, we as a people can uh, become back in charge of our governments and everything. I, I um, um, it seems like things have gone askew, but I want to keep on a positive note, like what you said. But I, I but in, in the United States, the people are supposed to be a sovereign as to their government, but we got flipped over like a pancake. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> they, changed, they changed the game. So it's up to us to change it. And uh, I was also just reading this pamphlet from my Christian science years called God's Law of Adjustment. It wasn't by Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, where I first learned how to do some amazing healing in 1960, starting in 1961 when I was 15 years old. Um, and it says, basically, if you connect in with God, then God will do the job for us. So I've been telling people that we have to do it. Maybe it's a combination of both. Mm -hmm. So. Well, you know, that's, uh, a, that's an interesting question, actually, or an interesting topic, because that's something that has been very, I've been very interested in that as well. It is basically, if I have to express it through through my words, it is uh, your will or actually the will of God becoming your will. That's how I understand being yeah. connected to God, basically, and, and having God 
settle settle down uh, your life in the best possible way is that similar to what to what you meant or what you mean yeah yeah that's very that's very close that woman mary baker Eddy, she was the most amazing woman probably in the last 2000 years there's one other woman that i would put in that category well i'd put all women above men but besides that uh, her name is um Ama or Amachi, and she lives in India, but she comes to the United States. She goes all over the world. One time I heard her talk, and for the very first time, my wife dragged me there. I said, oh, I don't want to go here, you know, this is, and, and then I got there, and then I had to eat all my words, and I had to uh, become very humble, because I could feel her heart energy from like, like 100 feet away. And then later on, I got to get a hug from her. But I'll be honest with you, her power from 100 feet away was equal to her power being right next to me. So mm. that's that's how you can know something. That's how you can know the power of something, the effect of it, the effect on, on, on how you feel it. And this Mary Baker Eddy believed nothing was impossible and everything she did um, – I know that she raised several people from the dead. She healed all manner of sickness. And uh, she built a church during World War II at a time, World War I at a time when there was no men and material to do it. And yet somehow she brought it into manifestation. And that was her way of connecting with God and letting God make it happen. And another thing amazing about this woman, which I wish I had myself, she never took a, a she never took offense to insults. Uh, she just you know with a plum. She just like with this like brush it off and just keep on going. And so that that's you know that's hard that's hard for some people to do. Some astrological signs like mine, which is Scorpio, and I was born on Halloween, is to to wit and makes it things very 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 intense and everything. So. I need to be around calm people or I need to calm myself. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Newton, what is your, you know, like speaking, I would, I would like to stay a little bit on the, on the topic of God. What is your own relationship to God? How, how do you understand God yourself? Yeah, that was a good question. Um, I remember that question from the pre-interview. Uh you know what? And no one's ever asked me that. So you're the smartest. You're the smartest. Or you're the most insightful of all. We're all smart. We're all image and likeness of God. But some of us know it more than others. Um, my thing was, well, I always wanted to know if there was a God. I mean, proof that there was a God. Okay. And this started from when I was like five years old, when I kind of began my mission but I'll be honest with you at five years old I didn't know this would be my mission but what I did find out was was rather profound I rebelled at the idea in the middle of a church Baptist church Protestant church uh, service at the idea that God would send me to hell because I didn't do this that or the other you know because I was just told in Sunday school that God was love and at five this didn't jive <laughs> with me and, and everything. And so um, anyway, I've, I've come to find out, uh, as I told you in that pre-interview, there's two things that I find very salient to this issue of God. First, all religions say God is everywhere. Well, there's more than two things. They say that God is everywhere. And I was always trying to figure out how that could be done. But when I started thinking of God being in control of the atomic field, all these little quadrillions of atoms and everything that comprise all creation, I go, okay, well, that would make it very easy to be every place at once. But if you were in a body anthrop anthropomorphized, then that wouldn't be possible. And yet no one's ever... I think I'm one of the few people that's ever put that together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not bragging about it. I'm just kind of astonished more people haven't haven't actually seen that. So in speaking of atoms and stuff, and um, Dr. Hugh Ross's uh, treatise on the internet called Origins of the Universe, he talks about how, how creation is like, 
and very tight parameters of 0.003 of 1%, not 1%, 0.003, a th uh, that would be a hundredth or a thousandth of 1% 1, 1 of 3% of 1% as uh, in regard to the strong nuclear force and to the electromagnetic field. And if the bonds between the atoms is too tight, then nothing can come into existence and to and to, and to form, and 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 if it's too loose, <coughs> once again nothing can coagulate together from atoms into molecules into something, you know, into something bigger. And so, so this at least shows us that there's an intelligent design to the universe. And that's kind of talked about in the Bhagavad Gita on page 369 of the Paramahansa Yogananda translation, where he talks about the intelligent cosmic vibration is yagna, which is fire, agna, which is light, and om, or the sound, the, the, the form of, uh, the form of, uh, the sound of creation, the, the vibration of creation. And then there's this other thing that I found on the internet when I was, uh, and I found that Dr. Hugh Ross thing when I was writing my book, A Map to Healing in 2011. <laughs> and the other thing that uh, I found on the internet doing that same book was um, an article. And it's interesting how I find this stuff. I wasn't directly looking for it, but it was put into my lap, just like that thing about the intelligent cosmic vibration i just open up the bhagavad gita to page 369 and there was the answer to the question that i had in my head right there so that's kind of a that's kind of a cool epiphany but anyway the other thing that's talked about by valerie p kondratov k k o n d r a t o v i believe uh her i uh her husband is victor kondratov he's a famous chemist Mm -hmm. And I think what she discovered is even more important that there were these um, nine geometric forms like triangles and and all all different forms and everything. But triangle seems to proliferate more than anything else that are the, the substrate of all creation. So, again, this shows kind of an intelligent design of sorts. And so while it doesn't exactly prove that there's a God, it does prove that there's something running the show. And when you consider how complex that and how prolific creation right now, the universe is expanding to this very second, probably a new uh, galaxy has been created yeah. in, in that kind of time. And I'm, uh, I've talked to some other people scientists and people deeply spiritual and i ask them um you know people think that the universe is going to contract and they think it comes from a big bang i don't think it came from a big bang but i know it's still expanding and i think it keeps expanding ever onward <coughs> well i believe now, the same actually you know because actually my, my understanding about when it comes to understanding God and life and our purpose in life. If I, if I take it as if, uh, okay, we are, we are living awareness, living consciousness, which is, which is here in this lifetime in order to uh, enrich the overall consciousness or the, the one common or yeah, the one consciousness. I mean, it, obviously it's expanding because each of us has many lives of uh, of lifetimes of experience, and all, each each of these life experiences are filling in that overall uh, one consciousness. So it is obviously expanding. You know, I mean, in a way, that's probably not the right way to explain it, but that's how I feel it. No, I, 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 that makes that makes sense to me, and. I think there's a case scientifically to may, be made for that viewpoint. I'm um, I'm 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 a person that's big on on science, but especially um, especially mathematics and things like that, which is like a pure science. Any way that you can do to go and prove things out is is um, 
I think helps the dialogue. It helps the, the understanding and the universal dialogue or it's called the morphic field in Ken Key's book, The Hundredth Monkey and Rupert Sheldrake's Morphic Resonance. So, and I think I think you will appreciate this, and you may have even thought of this, although very few people do. Where this concept came to me, this information that said we're all sharing atoms from the same atomic field and everything, that we're literally connected with each other, and yet, isn't it interesting how people use propaganda and insult and all kinds of things to try and separate us when we're inherently integrated, and that's kind of what what you know mary baker eddy said in science and health that that we're all one together in divine mind so um you know uh th this morning i'm i'm reading the um forcing miracles book and i mean yeah, i'm yeah i'm going i'm going through the workbook now and i'm on the exercise i cannot remember the number now but it's basically one of the many of the exercises repeat in a different form the today's exercise, uh, I've been through it many times already with the book, but now it is in a different form. It, the exercise is, um, or the topic of the day, it's uh, what I what I give is what I, I have been given. And I mean, it's it's so practical, you know, basically in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had this meditation in the morning um, asking for uh, for explanation of what does it mean. Already I have I have some explanation and some uh, some experience with it already. But I had a profound uh, insight this morning. Exactly, I could just dissolve in in that one field, uh, as you say, in that one magnetic or quantum field, and just could feel yes. that I'm just an expression, one expression of the quantum field. And whatever I put into that quantum field, it is coming back to me because I, I'm one and the same thing. So it is so simple, you know, absolutely so it really simple. Really is. So, yeah. That's the beauty of the Course in Miracles. I was, I was summarily amazed myself when I came in contact with it about twenty or thirty years ago. I go, wow, this is like, this is like, distilled truth with little, with with little manure uh, <laughs> attached. Now manure is great for uh, organic gardening, and I've had several organic run several organic farms, but. It doesn't help much in understanding things. That, <laughs> confusing things, yeah, <laughs> but not organizing them. So, uh, Doctor Newton, I'm I'm really interested to understand uh, what was that experience that you had in uh, five years old when you started realizing you have a purpose in life. How how you got about it? Well, I. No, how how did I experience it? Yeah, like what happened? Well, what happened I was for you? A relaying that I was sitting in a church service just after I'd gone to Sunday school, and I was next to my father and my mother. And this guy's telling me I'm going to go to hell if I don't accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Master. And I didn't have a problem accepting Jesus Christ as a Lord and Master, but I had a real big problem being sent to hell by a God that what I was just told was loving. Mm -hmm. So. When I told my, I told my father that, and my father told me to shut up, Robert, you know, and he's, <laughs> but not that loud, but you know, he like gave me, he gave me like the elbow and the ribs, you know, <laughs> because I was always dumping this things on him, ideas that were revolutionary, especially for the 1950s when not, no one knew about yoga or well, a few people that because Paramahansa Yogananda came from India to spread it, but and Swami Vivekananda sent some uh, disciples too. But um, it was in those times, it was really, really a dead time. And then when I found Christian science, and this woman's telling me that God loves me and that. I'm the image and likeness of God. I go, well, if I'm the image and likeness of God, I sure, I don't think God would be sending itself to hell, right? So. <laughs> Logic. <laughs> so that went on. And then uh, I, I flourished in that. I, I had hundreds of healings that I did of myself and other people. Um, 
And then I had a really bad motorcycle accident and a dirt motorcycle accident when I was 35, where I was like coming up this blind hill real steep. And there was only one way to make this. It's pin it all the way, <laughs> the throttle completely all the way open, or you hit this space. And then if you don't have enough speed, you'll start sliding backwards. And you don't want to do that on a steep hill. So I get up to the top. And I saw out of the corner of my eye, and I heard this guy saying, oh, shit. And he's coming about 60 miles an hour uh, 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 along this road at the top of this hill. And all all I had time was to, I, I saw him, and then I got, like, slammed into the ground. And, wow. Um, it was a... Uh, very traumatic experience. Uh, I don't even know how I got home. I didn't use an ambulance or, or anything because um, I be because I believe strongly in self healing. So you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna be a healer, then you should act like a healer and not not when I say act, not talk, but by your actions, by your <clears throat> by the things that you do and. My wife wanted me to go to the emergency room, and I said, oh, I'm not going there. And she said, but I, I was in immense pain. I won't say that I wasn't. And But uh, the next day, she says, well, I want you to go talk. There's a psychic fair. This was in, like, 1981. There's a psychic fair at this place called, uh, well, it was in Anaheim, Cynetics. And this I, I, there was a bunch of psychics there, and, and I said, which one should I go to? And my wife said, that older woman over there, she'll, she'll do a good reading on you. So I went over there, and she said right away, she says, you've been in a horrible accident. And I didn't tell her anything. I said, okay. she, you've been in a horrible accident, and you haven't turned. And have you been to the hospital? And I said, no. She says, well, you need to go immediately because you have internal bleeding. And I said, well... Uh, I know I did have internal bleeding, but I stopped the internal bleeding, although I will admit to you I'm in immense pain right now, but little by little I'm dealing with it without uh, painkillers and all of that kind of stuff. <coughs> and so that set me up on a course to go and check all kinds of things like um, hermetic knowledge, um, psychic realms, astrology, Buddhism, um, all kinds of different healing things and everything. And since that time in 1981, I've been still now at uh, 77 in 19 in, in uh, 2024. I'm still <clears throat> I'm still searching and learning. Uh, that motorcycle took the girdle off my well, took the girdle off my mind. Uh, there's this book that I used in helping me write my book. Uh, mm -hmm. That one I sent you. Oh, this one in the shadow of a in the shadow of a master. And yeah, it's um, it's available on Amazon. If if any of my books I talk about, oh, you you don't even need a link. You just put the name of the book, say "In the Shadow of a Master" by Dr. Robert Newton on Amazon, and it'll come up. Um, there's this book called The Aquarian Gospel of Christ, and it said that Jesus was dismayed by the knowledge of the rabbis. And we do have a little bit of information. When he was 12, he was in, uh, he was in a synagogue among the rabbis, and they were asking him all kinds of questions, and they were amazed at the answers that he gave, which means that they were beyond their existing knowledge. Hmm. But in, in that book, it says that the reason that um, the reason that the fact that the rabbis had built a wall around their beliefs from which they could not see over prompted him to go out and look, which is what this is book was about. It's about the 17 years, more or less, and a little more of the time in the scriptures that aren't really talked about. And what I found, what, what I found was really interesting and I confirmed this with uh, my Hindu priest friend, Dr. Sam Paul, 
who I'm involved with, with a uh, uh, positive life with yoga. Our organization, our nonprofit, is that there were there are texts and things that were not only talk about Jesus being in this, they prophesied Jesus coming to India like 1,300 years before he did in one book called the Bhashiva Purana. And there's other books that talk about it. One is called Telugu, T-E-L-E-G-U. Um, May I ask you, well, speaking about Jesus, who who Jesus is in your eyes? How do you understand who Jesus is? How we describe who Jesus is? Based on all your knowledge that you have today, uh, of course, in comparison to wow. where you were sitting in that church in five years old, <laughs> old and today, how how your how your understanding of Jesus has changed since then? Well. There's this, uh, Jesus was, for me, Jesus was a son of God, not the son of God. And this is where Christians get wrapped up and trapped in the apophrical texts or the texts that are accepted, and but, but many were discarded, like the Gnostic texts, which I used huh, liberally, liberally to fill in the gaps in the life of Jesus. And also in this one about Mary Magdalene, who there was even less information. So you have to go and you have to run things down. But he was the expression of the Christ. But, you know, he did say in John 14, 12, which if I wanted to control people, I would have deleted from the Bible because I believe that it was a control mechanism in many ways. It's talked about in Roman Roman Piso's book, Piso Christ. When you say it's he's that, an expression, oh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, go yeah, on. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you said you said that uh, he's an expression of Christ. So, uh, who is Christ then, or what, or what is what is Christ? Well, Christ would be the what some people call the Adam Cadman archetype of, of the perfect creation. Okay, someone that is, I, I think you mentioned it before, is like allowed themselves to be directed to become the wheel of God. One, one with God. And it's, um, now I started to say in John 14, 12, Jesus said, uh, these works shall ye do also for I go unto my father. And then he says, but greater works than these shall ye do also. And then this is what everyone in organized Christianity, they miss it because I ask them all the time. I ask people, if <laughs> we're so limited. Why did Jesus say this in John 14, 12? And also Hermes Trismegistus also talks about this in the Corpus Hermeticum. He says, you are, you, you, are, you are from a perfect source. Why do you not claim what is your birthright to have? Yeah, yeah, well, that's a big question. That's a big question. So, and there's also been other sons of God I wanna throw out really quickly. One I learned recently. One is the Lord, Lord Buddha was an incarnation of the Lord God Vishnu, as was Krishna, that was about 2,500 years ago. Krishna, 5,100 years ago, was a, and also an incarnation of the Lord God Vishnu. And, three, and this is in India. All of these things happened. And then Rama, or Ram, was the incarnation of the Lord God Vishnu 330,000 years ago. So there's, there, there's a lineage. And this is like this is like the perfected man or the perfected woman. I don't want to give women short shrift on this. Um, everyone refers to God as he or him, and yet uh, in the Gospel of the Sophia Jesus Christ, which is a Gnostic scripture, 
It really talks about how the feminine is the real power. More powerful is powerful as far as bringing things into manifestation or into a creational state. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but you won't find that term in, in the apophical text of the New Testament or even the Old Testament. Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, I that's that's what I I'm I as well feel and what I've been getting as well from from some of the teachers that I've been uh, learning from and 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 reading books from as well. It's uh, like the the power of the of the female and yeah. the female female awareness. Uh, is is huge as well yeah well i had to come a long ways because the time that i'm that this incarnation is from um there was a lot of chauvinism a lot of paternalism and everything and there was a gradual process i remember when i married my first wife who i was very much in love with and but we'd never lived together before. So there was a process of attunement. And I told my wife one day, I said, well, this, this is the way we're going to do it. And she says, oh, this is, a, this is a marriage. You're not the only person here. And I said, oh, well, the, the man is supposed to lead. You know, the man is supposed to be the boss. Oh, my, my, my. <laughs> but this was a general, this was overall accepted in the time. No one ever questioned it. All right. Well, I think you know. In in my view, uh, <coughs> in 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 comparison to how it is widely understood, well, there is a there is an element of providing a lead, but it's not the not leading in the way how normally I think today society understands it. Because I think you know what I believe is that uh, there is a there is a female awareness and male awareness and both of them they have a specific role in life in order to uh, to to give uh, to to cooperate you know to 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 achieve like intelligent cooperation well that's and, absolutely yeah go ahead yeah and while 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 you know like the the male uh, has certain predilections uh which you know are about Basically, you know, he's more rational in his approach in, in, in life. He's more logical, let's say. Females are, are more, uh, more sensitive. They are more, um, uh, they are more intuitive. And basically, there is, a, there is this way of cooperation between the two states of awareness between male and female. And in that, in that, in that sense, the male have a certain role of providing elite... Oh, yeah. And and the female taking that lead, adopting or like taking that lead, accepting that lead, but it's not it's not the way how the macho man today, you know, has been trying to do it by <laughs> imposing yeah. imposing yeah. A, a lead or a direction. Yeah, well, we we, we made we made stuff so the so the the female is a negative polarity, not negative meaning pejorative or bad, but negative charge. <laughs> and the male is a plus charge. So you need those two charges to come together. That's what electricity is. That's what an atom it is, an atom or atom. It has both charges in there. If you just have positive, positive, or negative, negative, you get direct current, which doesn't have near the amperage or the power of alternating current, which is what happens when positive and negative get together and do their dance <laughs> absolutely absolutely and and by the way one of the predilections of of the female in life is uh, to see to she's able to see the negative better than the men you know on to bring all <laughs> yeah. the negative and well, usually usually males you know men they they don't accept that very positively you know when whenever no, they don't. <laughs> whenever i come with some idea at home and my wife would immediately bring up the negative and if I'm not aware of actually the fact that she's a female and she's in a female awareness, and of course her role is to bring in the negative, you know, I immediately would get pissed off and I would say, "Why well, you are always so negative. <laughs> and that's what happens, you know, and that's where the, 
the problem come off uh, the problems come off uh, normally but uh, people you know they, they don't get this education and this knowledge uh, from from anywhere uh, we are not taught at school about like male and female relationships and uh, and basically no. uh, yeah so <laughs> we're, we're not and at my time I don't think there was enough understanding to even teach it if someone <laughs> wanted to teach it because <laughs> it takes in that you know I was talking about morphic fields or something uh, um, Ken Keys and Rupert Sheldrake and, and all of that and it, it's interesting if if you want something to gestate into something bigger than it is already, then someone has to take the thought, express the thought, and then other people need to follow. And when you reach a certain critical mass, and it doesn't even have to be 50%, it could be 6%, 10%, something like that, then, then an enlightened minority can drag <laughs> an ignorant people into a higher into a higher understanding and into a higher field. But right now, you have people that want to control your speech. They dreamed up in my country, and I don't know about in, in Czech Republic, but in my country, they have this thing called hate speech. But, uh, but at the same time, we have this thing called free speech. And if you have free speech, then there can be no hate speech because free speech means that you can, can express what they think is hateful. And that doesn't necessarily make it right, but at least they have the, the, the right to, to, to express it. So there's been, there's been a, a dedicated effort to like to constrict things like We don't want this information out, and you have people trying to control the field of thought on the ideas of thought on the internet as well. Yeah, so I'm abs I'm absolutely sure about it. I've seen. Yeah, I mean that's 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 how I see things, and uh, you know, for me, though, uh, the way how to approach that is to focus on creating something new instead of trying to fight the old and that's that's what interests me as well in terms of you know when you were five and you understood you have a mission in life and you started preparing for your mission and you've been through so many areas of uh of and so many endeavors in terms of creating something new of healing and and you just mentioned that you've uh run uh, many organic farms and so on yeah where in in which endeavors in your life you feel you have been making the biggest difference in terms of creating the new as opposed to you know what you have been seeing in these societies of trying to keep humanity down and not allowing allowing the the new to come in well that's why i write my books i don't just write them to to get to do something that i think is impressive i i write things that are germane to this human situation. And I take what a problem is and then I give a solution for it. Just like on my uh, podcast, which is taking a sabbatical right now, Solution Revolution, I would always come up with things and then I would show, okay, here's a problem, here's a difficulty, here's a way that we can get through it and 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 stuff like that. So. I mean, you know, the, the one the one greatest thing that I've done that has the most potential to change the earth. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. I'm being told right now. One of my guides is telling me, wake up. Okay, I'm up. Uh, as a Kriya Kundalini Yoga that I do, this, this creates great, This, this puts you in a state of controlling your mind because a lot of people think of yoga as a bunch of 
stretches and poses and counter poses, and it is, but that's just the first step. The next step is to learn how to control your mind through a structured meditation. In other words, you're not allowing the mind to wander. You're forcing it to look at a, 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 a certain thing. So, and uh, Kriya Dhyana and Kriya Kundalini Yoga, the first thing is nada. In other words, you're meditating on nothing. And so this is like um, really hard for most people to do, but nada in, 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 uh, in, it means nothing in Sanskrit. It also means nothing in Spanish. Uh, so as I was taught, as my yogi, Yoga Kavinan Satchitananda was uh, teaching me this stuff, I felt that there was a certain thing missing there that could make it easier. So I came up with this idea when I'm teaching people this, I said, just, just take yourself into a state of darkness, no light, just darkness and everything, because there's still light in the darkness, but just take yourself into that state and then that will allow you to think of nothing. And then there's other meditations there an extended breathing cadence like pranayama where if you slow down your breathing and if you can actually breathe if you if you can actually breathe out exhale twice as much as you do the inhale with your mouth closed and just through your nose what will start happening is the heart is going to start to open the vagus the vagus nerve that starts in, uh, hopefully I can get this on the screen right here at the medulla oblongata, and it goes down through all, it goes up and branches up into all the organs and, and ends in the um, tailbone area. Um, this will make you feel better and everything. It'll, it'll add a state of bliss and also, uh, uh, and a doctor friend of mine, Mauro, Dr. Mauro Zapatera, is an expert on spirit, uh, spinal, cerebral spinal fluid, which is in the brain, and then it goes, and then it goes down into the, into the spinal column and everything. And this is another thing that allows the heart to open. It balances out everything. It, it can create a natural high and everything as opposed to taking drugs to get to that high and uh, everyone seems to want a quick way to doing things like that to get high but just like in the case of marijuana the more that you smoke the more you need to get to a certain high till you'll reach a certain point where you won't even get a high from it anymore it'll just take you back to the middle mm-hmm but on this, there's no resistance, you know, there's no built up or stuff like that, that, that causes, causes the effect to lessen each time. Actually, the, when you do it with, with meditation, then it increases each time and you don't have to go back to that set point and get to that and then keep, and then go up and then go back and then go up, get high, then come back. I don't know if that makes any sense. Maybe I should explain it differently. Yeah, absolutely. I I I understand. You know, I'm I'm actually uh, curious to understand my, maybe a little bit uh, more about what is uh, what exactly is uh, how or what is Kriya Kundalini Yoga in terms of practice. You know, if that's that's about the meditation as well, or are there as well any exercises like in the classical yoga that you know like yeah the masses will know or how, how it works yeah well it starts out with the asanas which are poses so if i go back like this then i have to come forward maybe down to my toes this is like what they use in physical therapy it's called pose and counter pose or move and counter move then you go to the Kriya Dhyana meditations, those structured ones that they start out. You know, the second one besides after the Nada, where you think about nothing, it's called uh, Ekka Nalai. 
that means one point. So you're focusing just on one little aspect of like a bigger object. I would always take a diamond and just focus on one one point in the facet of it or something like that. Okay, so it has um, multiple benefits. I think uh, it's um, the first book I wrote, Pathways to God. That was a lot of work. Uh, the, that was in uh, about 1990. And then I didn't get that published for about 20 years. And then in um, 2011, I decided to write a book on healing because I learned a lot of stuff, but I felt that it wasn't portrayed exactly as in, in the optimum manner. So I decided to do that. And when I did that, I did the first book I did, Pathways to God, I did that with uh, outline. After that, I didn't even use an outline. I have never used an outline for anything that I've written since then. And I'm not against people doing it. So you just go, you just go for you. You pick up a topic. You feel like you have something to to write about, and you go for writing, right? Yeah, and it just and I just start. Uh, I just start doing it. And are your are your books uh, fiction or uh, nonfiction or what are the topics that you that you write about? Because you have you have how many eighteen books or uh, something some like that? I don't. Yeah. My ego doesn't need to count them. <laughs> Anyway, I'm just a conduit anyway. Oh, you have quite quite a quite a few. Quite so a few books. This book yeah. right here. That's your first book. Pro or no, no, no. It's no. about my fifth or sixth or seventh book, The Immortality Prophecy. Um that's nonfiction. And if if you believe you're capable of more than what you've been told, then you need to read this book because um, I, I didn't know how it was going to come out. <clears throat> and along the way, I was being told things. I would get psychic impressions and stuff that's called the Kajic knowledge. It's talked about in the in the Indian Vedas and the Upanishads. That's what I wanted to ask you about, actually, how this, that works. But just go and finish your thought and we can come back to well, that. Well, yeah. Well, it's an interesting process. Um, but then... I, I would get this stuff, but then I would say, okay, I've got this, but I have to prove it to people. So then I get on, I get on the internet and I start running stuff down and I start getting the confirmation of it. If I can't come, <clears throat> if I write about something, almost, almost everything that I put in this book was verified. If it wasn't verified, I, I, I admit it so, okay? In other words, I'm not saying, trust me, I'm a doctor because I know a lot of doctors I wouldn't trust. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, What that book is about, Dr. Newton? What, what you're out, what, what, what is, what, it, what is it's, it? It's about uh, lon longevity and about actually taking the body into a state of immortality. Is that really possible? It's been done by a few people. Okay, so I'm one, that, I'm one that's dedicated to doing it. I probably wouldn't even be hanging around here at 77 if uh, if I didn't have the mission to show that was done. The last time that I know it was done was in 204 AD, no, two, 219 AD. Uh, Babaji Nagarachu is one of the avatars or uh, sat gurus in the Satguru means a, a, a guru beyond a meta, a meta guru, something like that. Um, what, uh, so what he would incarnated be... in 204 AD and then went into what's called Saruba Samadhi, which is a state of breathless consciousness and existence in a body in 219 AD. But I know there's been a few others that have done it. When people do it, they don't make a big celebration and they don't go on Oprah and brag. <laughs> and oh, I'm brag sure about it. it. Yeah, I'm sure about it. What What do you think would be the purpose of of uh, immortality? Uh, frankly, I feel it's a waste of time 
reincarnating over and over again. You just get to a point right like now. I have a lot of wisdom and I have a lot of abilities. When you come back, you have to start over so much. Although I think I cheated a little bit. A lot of people believe that when you reincarnate, well, a lot of people don't believe, don't even believe you reincarnate. And there was a time I didn't either. So I, I will put that out there. And so I don't want to be all sanctimonious and all of that. Um, but um, what, are the, what are the techniques for achieving that state of immortality or getting closer to it? Well, at least I put it's it all in the book. book. <laughs> I put it in the book. I, this is. Did I, what I say, this book sold a lot of copies? No, because some people said it was too hard to read. I said, I was I was talking to someone about that. I said, if you realize how complicated the information I got and how I made it more understandable, then you might be less, <laughs> you might be more appreciative of the fact of what was involved in trying to do that. And that's what a lot of people have told me. They said, even if they don't agree with me, they say, you have a way of explaining things that makes it understandable. And, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not an ego trip with me, but I want to go beyond what the, the way my teachers taught me or the things that I learned. Some of the things I learned uh, from past lifetime knowledge and things like that. So it's believed that when you pass and you come back, I, I think that the, the, the angels and stuff, they tell you, oh, yeah, you should go back there. You'll have a good time. And then you get down there and you get on earth and you go, holy shit, man, this place is really intense. No, it's like you got people that should be working with each other that are fighting each other and insulting each other. <laughs> well, on, on that note, on when on that note, what be what would be your closing message to all listeners and viewers who want to experience sustainable health and well-being in their life? What what would be your message to them? Well, I'm gonna uh, my just getting my website redone. Uh, you could check it now, but it's gonna be a lot better. www.drrobertnewton.com. Just Google my name, Dr. Robert J. Newton, and it'll come up on the search results. Um, and all the links will be as well in the description of and, this uh, this podcast. Uh, so definitely, the link to your webpage will yeah. be featured there. So the the, www dot positive life with yoga well, we're willing to go around the world it's simply a sense of of economics if you can put enough people together uh i'll probably show up um uh, we'll probably show up and do it we've uh, we, i just did a class with about 50 to 70 people that was pretty intense way too big but um because i'd like to give individual attention um uh at least if you don't do kriya kundalini yoga get into some kind of yoga get into some kind of meditation every day um remember with your eyes you can turn them upward like this and although my eyes look closed they're not they're fluttering i can still see a little bit of light um Try to build bridges to other people. Don't let people, don't let people use propaganda. And this is very subtle. This is the, this very, very easy to program someone's mind subliminally, subliminally. So it's against a lot of use subliminal messages, but there's plenty of subliminal pictures that are being put through all kinds of things. They're embedded in movies. Personally, I would never let my kid watch a Disney movie movie or anything related to Disney because it's very different than it was when I was growing up. Um, it's been overtaken by what I would, well, I'm, I'm, I'll try to be my nice. I'll try and be like Mary Baker Eddy, people who are prone to erroneous thinking. Most people would call it demonic and everything. I'm trying to be nicer because I want to build a bridge between people. And if I call you demonic, I'm your subconscious is going to shut me out. So I can't, 
I can't get through to you. <laughs> Even though it might be accurate, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You have to be, <laughs> you have to get people someplace to come in and like grab, take a hand. And if they can't grasp, grasp your hand, maybe they can touch one of your fingertips right there. That's the beginning. And then, then you're connected. All right. Uh, okay. The, the governments and the religions have led us wayward. I'll just say that. So we need to create better. We need to create better models to follow. That's what how I see it as well and what it is all about. Create better models. I, I believe in that firmly as well. Um, so this I will I will take this as as your closing advice <laughs> on this show. Create focus on create uh, creating better models and uh, for living and for life. Yeah. Well, if 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 for you know if you have um, if you have um, what do you call that thing where they got. You got a rope and you got two group groups of people trying to pull the other group forward and everything. What happened if what what would happen if everyone got on one side of the rope and the problems were on the other side and we could pull them real easy and deal with them and take those problems into uh, a solution or solutions. I agree with that. Or a tug of war. Tug of war is what it is. Probably no one knows what that is anymore. But when in the fifties, it was a big thing. It was a big macho thing. Who was the better? Who was stronger? I agree with that. <coughs> well, uh, Doctor well, Newton, thank you, thank you very me. much. Thank you very much. Thank you for being my guest today. Um, it was very interesting uh, discussion, and uh, I think I learned quite a lot of uh, new stuff. And I hope the listeners and viewers as well, and they enjoyed our conversation. So uh, a few quiet closing words to uh, everyone who's been listening. Uh, this is the Healing with Coherence uh, podcast series. Uh, and I will repeat again, we are on all podcast platforms uh, as well as uh, video platforms like YouTube. And uh, it will be great if you joined our community. And if you are not yet subscribed, uh, please hit subscribe or follow button and, and become part of our community. And we, you will not be missing on upcoming shows. Dr. Robert J. Newton was our guest today. Uh, Dr. Newton, thank you one more time. Uh, it was oh, really you. a pleasure to For be here. A nice forum where I could actually share some stuff that I think will help everyone.